Welcome back to Witch Wednesdays. Today we're talking all about ancestors, ancestor altars, how to create one, and how to connect. Welcome back for Vlogtober Day 19, all about ancestor altars. Today's video is in collaboration with Aurora over at Lavender Hazelwood Witches. I'm going to have everything linked below. Here is a little clip to get you excited for her version. Doesn't that look just beautiful? We are both working on ancestor altars today. And something I love about that you know, idea of collaboration is just seeing all of the different options out there because no two witches are going to practice exactly the same. And that includes how to set up and use an ancestor altar. So I thought it was gonna be really fun to see what other people are up to. And I encourage you to go check out that video, of course, and then leave your comments here or there and let us know what you are planning or have already done for your ancestor altar. How have you set it up? What have you included? How are you working with it? I would love to know because I'm always looking for different ideas and it's something that changes with time, changes every season, and it changes every year. So I'm always looking for new ideas. Let me know. Our street out front is just permanently under construction, it seems like. So I did film my version this morning and hopefully, you know, it's a little dark and moody, but hopefully you enjoy that because there it was just no filming it um, while they are working. So might be a little dark, but hopefully that just adds to the atmosphere. So before I show you some of the pieces that I'm going to be putting on my altar and getting those ready through ritual, let's talk a little bit about ancestor altars in general. Ancestor work is very popular this time of year as our ancestor altars. This is just the time when the veil between worlds is very thin to make it very easy to communicate with ancestors. So it's very common in cultures all over the world to make altars at this time of year. But of course, it's not the only time to work with them. And it is ideal if you have an ancestor relationship going all year round. Many people do leave their ancestors altars up all year round, but I completely understand if you do not have the space for that. What you make for Samhain can just be a temporary altar, and you can think of altars in very broad terms. It does not have to look like a traditional witch's altar that you see on Instagram. It can just be maybe a shelf in your living room where you have some pictures of your family members who have passed on. So you really aren't limited in what the word altar means. I have more space to dedicate to an altar space during the month of November and then less space throughout the year, so it can be something temporary. I always like to recommend a ancestor tray. That is a great start if you're trying to look for a space and then that can be easily moved and you can include a picture of your ancestor, a crystal, a feather, small mirror, space for offering, just things like that that would assist you in communicating with your ancestor and then little mementos that remind you of them, of things that they may have been associated with in life. First thing to do when setting up your altar is to sort of plan out the how and the why. There are a few different ways to set up and use an ancestor altar. And the difference really is whether you are using that space for veneration or for workings. Veneration is more of just honoring your ancestors, remembering them, maybe communicating with them, but it is really a place to celebrate and remember them and not necessarily ask for their assistance in your witchcraft workings. Where whereas a working ancestor altar is that space where you would ask them for help and guidance. So just think about what your plan is. Either one or a combination of both is fine, whatever works for you and your practice. So it can be a space where you are going to honor them, express gratitude, leave offerings, ask for assistance, or as a place to work on ancestral healing if there are things in your lineage that have are being passed down that are harmful that you want to heal for your family line. So just think about how you will work the space and how you'll work within this space to sort of determine what kind of setup you would need and how much space you would need for that. 
And do keep in mind how long you're going to spend there and kind of what your time commitment is going to look like. As far as what ancestors to include and who to reach out to, that is uh, a wide and varying topic. So there are, first of all, the difference between the known dead and the unknown dead. The known dead are those that passed in your lifetime that you knew had contact with, you know their name, whereas the unknown dead are the older ancestors whose names have just been lost to time. I am of the opinion that anyone can be considered an ancestor and I am adopted, so I don't believe that you can only contact your blood ancestors because I don't know any of my blood ancestors. To me, those would be unknown dead and I can absolutely reach out to them and see what kind of information and guidance they have for me, but I can absolutely also reach out to my adoptive family. You'll see on my altar in the three candles that they represent ancestors of blood, spirit, and land. So my adopted family would be my ancestors of spirit. And for you, that might be godparents or friends that have passed on that you were not blood related to, but they could still be considered your ancestors. They had a major effect on their your life and you would like to keep in contact with them. So you can reach out to those known ancestors. It's okay if they are unknown, if you are also adopted, if you have a lineage, family of immigrants where you don't have those records, that's okay to not know their names. You can still reach out further back in your line and establish a relationship with those people. And on the flip side of that, you can not include anybody that you don't want to. My grandparents on my mother's side are horrible. Uh, my grandmother is still alive, grandfather is dead, and I would never reach out to him to include in my ancestor altar. I would never invite him into the space. So when I am creating that altar and inviting my ancestors in, that is an open invitation to the people that I want to have contact with that have good intentions. And some people believe that after you die, their spirits are on another plane, they're sort of above it all and above the nastiness that was in life and they have transcended. I don't believe that's the case for my grandfather and I don't believe it will be the case for my grandmother. So I would not work with him and I would not invite him into my space and that is perfectly fine. That is completely up to you. You don't have to make it an open invitation to everybody. It's your space and your workings and you can exclude whoever you want to. As far as what to include when you are actually setting up your altar, it's most common to put down some sort of cloth that is just a protective surface for when you're giving offerings and lighting candles to keep your tabletops nice and clean. Usually black is the go-to color for death ancestors remembrance, but you can use any color that you associate with whoever you are sending that altar to. So if you are reaching out to your grandmother and she wore a very specific shade of red lipstick, you can absolutely include red on your altar instead. You also want to include any mementos of things that you associate with those ancestors. Something that was related to the hobbies or profession that they had in life. Those things will make it a little bit easier to connect. So photographs are great if you have them. It is similar to using a tag lock in a spell when you want to connect a spell to you or someone else. Like a tag lock would be using one of their personal items or using your hair or nails to further connect that spell to you or that person. This works in a similar way by having those representations on your altar, you are further establishing that energetic connection with that specific ancestor. If you don't know their names or anything about them, again, you are working with that category of unknown dead, then you just want to use representations of humans, which is why skulls are so popular on ancestor altars. Skulls are great for communication. Ancient cultures used to believe that the soul was contained within the head. So you are speaking directly to that person when you have that skull representation on your altar. Skulls are also just a symbol of death and a way of honoring death in general. And then we get into what do you do with this altar once you have it? First and foremost, it is a place to communicate. You don't have to start out with anything complicated. It really is just a place for you to grow those relationships. Just saying hello each day, good morning, letting them know that you're heading off to work for the day. Some people prefer to pray at the end of the day and speak to their ancestors then. It can be very casual. You can simply sit there and enjoy the company and their presence and reminisce about good times that you had. There really are no rules about what you're allowed to communicate about. So if you do have questions and you want to work with your ancestors, you can ask them for signs and for guidance, do a meditation. You can ask them to come to you in dreams and provide that. And you can also try tarot or pendulums to ask your questions and see what answers they are able to give you. That's something that just takes practice because uh, they can be quite subtle and symbolic. 
much like reading a crystal ball, which we just talked about yesterday. So deciphering those symbols that come in is just a work of practice. And then of course you can give offerings. Incense, candles, and alcohol are the most generic and most common alcohol, especially because um, it evaporates quickly. But also if you know the particular alcohol that they enjoyed in life, that is a great offering. You can also do food. If there's a particular food that they enjoyed, you can leave that out for 24 hours. And water, you can leave water out for about a week. You do want to make offerings on a regular time frame, just like any other spirit or fray that you work with. It's all about the communication, so be sure to choose something that works for you. Uh, once a week is the most common, but if you can only make it work once a month, as long as you communicate that, that's the most important thing. And then to follow up with that time frame. So if you have to set an alarm on your phone or in your Google Cal, then do that so you are on time. And once you put out the offering, just invite them to partake. And again, don't forget that you can refuse anyone that you don't want to be joining in. So that is your space as well to make that claim over. And then from there, just be sure to clean it regularly. And although we are talking about the specific altar space, remember that you can connect with ancestors outside of an altar space as well and outside of your home in general by going to restaurants that they love, trying hobbies uh, that they enjoyed in life. That can be a nice way to get out there and connect with your ancestors without just being stuck inside next to an altar. And then the last idea is about that working altar and getting their assistance in spells and rituals. The question of course is why would you want to do this? And it is like any other deity or spirit that you may ask to assist you. And that is because they can offer energetic assistance on a spiritual plane. So while you are doing the mundane physical work here, they can offer extra assistance in that spiritual plane for you. They may also be able to help you if you are casting a spell in something that they had specific knowledge in. So yesterday when I talked about cemetery etiquette and I mentioned um, that my dad was a doctor and that's the one thing that I would use graveyard dirt for is if it was a health and healing spell, that is the same thing that I would request his assistance with in any ancestor work. If I were looking for help or guidance and really at a loss and I would need his energetic assistance, it would be something health related. And you will see also on the altar that I am going to show you, I also have my uncle on there who is great with finances. So if I have a money working that I need assistance on, I would ask for his assistance in that. So if they had a particular knowledge or skill set in life, that is something that you could tap into to increase your workings and your rituals. Ancestor altars are not required. It really is up to you if you want to work with them or not, but it can be very helpful. But if you just want a place to connect with them and do sort of an ancestor veneration as well, just to offer gratitude and remembrance, that's fine too. It can be a nice practice either way, and this is just such a great time to connect. So let's jump over into my little ritual for getting everything set up. So I have some of the items here that I am going to use on my ancestor altar, but first I wanted to do a little ritual here. I have my dad and my uncle. I have a horseshoe, a little mini one because they were both horse owners, horse lovers. I have a star mica here, which helps with ancestor communication. I have a skeleton key here as well. Like I said, skulls for communication and skeleton keys open every door. So they are a symbol of opening pathways. And here I have the death card from the Antique Anatomy Tarot deck. For this ritual, you need three candles. I went with colors of the season, but you can go with any three colors that call to you. You need a candle for your ancestors of blood, spirit, and the land. To start, ring a bell over your ritual space. And light the candles one by one. As the candles burn down, just take each one and meditate on the ancestors that it represents, pray to them, talk to them, and then move on to the next candle and allow them to burn all the way down. Once you have finished your meditation and speaking with your ancestors, ring the bell one more time to signal that you're done. And finish allowing the candles to burn out. And then you are ready to take these items and place them on your temporary or permanent ancestor altar. Add any additional items and set up a space for offerings. And here's what the setup looks like as part of my working Samhain altar that I have here. I have this over to the side so I can keep it front and center during 
the Samhain season and into November, and then I have it on this tray here so I can move it any other time. I have a candle there to light when I'm spending time here, and here's my offering cup. So I've got that skull going in there. It is in fact a shot glass. And then my offering of my dad's favorite liquor, Christian Brothers Brandy. Not to my personal taste, but uh, my dad drank this for years. So then I can pour that into my little shot glass here as offering. I hope you enjoyed that look at my ancestor altar. Thank you for watching Vlogtober day number 19. If you haven't yet, be sure to go check out Aurora's video. Everything will be linked below. And I will see you for Vlogtober day 20 tomorrow.